All right, guys, I hope you've been enjoying this exploration of the prophet Jonah. And maybe we've learned more about how not to represent God than how to represent God in this story. But there are some exemplary people in this short and very vibrant story. We expected Jonah, as his role as, as prophet tends to suggest, to represent God well. But in fact, in this satire of God's people during a time of idolatry and pride, the only people who respond properly to God in this story are the sailors and the Ninevites. And both of those groups were pagans. The people we least expected to respond to God are the people we can learn the most from in this story. So let's dive into it. I'm going to revisit an earlier section of the story that we looked at. We're going to read it again, trying to understand the perspective of the sailors. I'm in a bubble, yay! Okay, um, let's revisit the sailors from earlier in Jonah. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation, and where do you come from? And what is your country, and of what people are you? And he said to them, I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O oh Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood for you. O oh Lord, have done it as you has pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea. The sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. So did you guys catch all this? The sailors had great theological instinct. They knew that the problem in their life was theological. And what I mean by that is when life was going poorly, and the chaos of the storm. They assumed that there was something out of sync with their relationship with God, and they assumed correctly. But I find them asking the right question, and I think I could pose the question to us. When things in our life are chaotic, and there seems to be some sort of interruption that's so hard to ignore, are we too assessing our relationship with God as the sailors were? Notice here that they are concerned about Jonah's life. Even Jonah doesn't seem concerned about Jonah's life. And he's certainly not concerned about the sailors, right? He won't jump out of the ship. He won't help them bail cargo. He's down sleeping. He doesn't talk to God. He doesn't pray for repentance. He doesn't say, hey, can we just turn his boat around? I got to go the other direction. We might could hear him in the famous words of my favorite dwarf. Touch me. Jump the decision, have to toss me. Toss me. Toss me. He's not saying, hey, let me fix my relationship with God and then 
you know, then I'll maybe tell you guys about him because he's pretty great. They don't want to murder him. And then they actually continue to fight, to sail, they row. You know, let's take a look at the kind of boat this might have been. That might help us picture the scene a little bit more. I'm in a bubble. Yep, again. Uh, let's take a look at the kind of boat that this might have been to get ourselves a little picture of this whole throwing cargo out and rowing thing. Though these were often used in warfare, you know, ramming speed, uh, these were also used for cargo. Just imagine something kind of like this. So as you can see, the, the, they tried to row their way out of trouble. They got enough cargo out to lighten it as much as they could, and they're still in jeopardy. They cared about Jonah so much, they got rid of the things that they were going to sell. Do you realize this is, this is costing them to keep Jonah alive? The idea of lots here, that, that, that they're asking for divine help. They're just, they're, they're throwing up a prayer here. And God actually participates in this, in this method. And, and he does so with Israel as well. And so this is ancient and strange. But they're trying to reach out in the only way they know how to the living God. And they get an answer. And guys, what I, what I want to say here is that they realize they are in a spiritual crisis, a, a literal and spiritual crisis, and they're not asleep. Don't sleep through your spiritual crisis. Do as the sailors did. Ask the questions, seek the actions, and attempt to hear and to listen to the counsel of God. What is their response? Did you guys catch it? Fear. It seems like a challenging concept at times, fear. In the New Testament, you have this idea that, that, that perfect love drives out all fear. But then in the Old Testament, you have this idea of, of the fear of the Lord as the beginning of wisdom. And I think one way to really helpfully merge these two ideas together is, is fear is something that is expressed in respect. That they realize that they should take God seriously. They take God seriously, and what do they end up doing, guys? They end up sacrificing and making vows to God. That these people saw the power of God. They saw that he was there and he had control over this situation. And they saw that they could make their lives right with God, and God responded. And so what you have here is a presupposition by asking the question, who knows, maybe the God will relent, becomes a theme. That what they expect from God is different than what Jonah expects from God. They expected God's mercy and they received it. So maybe this is a fluke, right? Uh, these sailors just had such a good responsiveness and a spiritual intuition and they expected God's mercy and they received it, but, you know, it's a good story, but most people don't respond to God that way. Well, and the surprising and riveting story of Jonah, which I'm not choosing to highlight a whole lot here about Jonah's success, but he does get spit out and he has a second chance. It feels like some deja vu. God, God's word came to Jonah and he said, go to Nineveh, that great city. And sure enough, Jonah goes. And when he gets to Nineveh, Nineveh will be overturned. Like there's no action steps. Like I think God is attempting to call Nineveh into repentance, right? But they kind of figure that out themselves. Like Jonah's message is really non-distinct. It doesn't give any action steps. I have a professor, that, uh, Dr. Palmer, that suggested that, that Jonah seems to even in obedience is attempting to sabotage the Ninevites opportunity for repentance but they they get it what was their key response like we had fear a minute ago from the sailors and now they're in Nineveh and what is the response now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city three days journey in breadth Jonah began to go into the city going a day's journey and he called out yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown and the people of Nineveh believed God they called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them the word reached the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne removed his robe covered himself in sackcloth and sat in ashes and he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles 
Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. The response is belief. They put their faith in the God that Jonah was pronouncing. And, and might I add, this is a, a foreign God, right? This is not the God of, of, of the, the pantheon they're familiar with. This is not Marduk. This is not um, uh, Ninua. This is, this is a different God, and they're believing in this God from one of their enemy territories, the Hebrews. So they too realize the theological crisis at hand. But Jonah doesn't give them instructions. He doesn't say repent. He doesn't say, here, do this, do that, and you can make your relationship with God right. Because Jonah seems to be sabotaging his own message. But they figure it out. What do they do? Well, they decide to get in sackcloth. So. At this point in the video, I, I think it's fun to make this interactive. If you would pause when I put up the screen to pause, and, and would you research just very quickly, just do a brief Google search of Bible verses with sackcloth, and read around the near context of sackcloth, and then ask the question on, why would you put sackcloth on? And I, I bet you could figure it out. We just learned something about ancient culture and expectations, that they're using something on the outside to tell God something on the inside. And so what we have here is they're putting on sackcloth in mourning, in repentance, and they're wearing ashes. And it's really interesting. It says from the greatest to the least, their, their attempt to display repentance wholesale is so grandiose. And then when the king gets word of it, he even declares an edict that even the cows and the livestock are going to fast. So guys, it's almost comical how repentant Nineveh has become. And again, we have the spiritual intuition of the Ninevites, and the king represents this. Who knows? God may yet relent. The idea here that, that what are the Ninevites expecting from God? If they expected God to destroy them utterly, why bother to put on sackcloth and sit in ashes and have the cows fast and fast yourself? Why bother to go through that? Why bother to ask the question, who knows, he may relent? Except the Ninevites are anticipating mercy. They're anticipating God changing what was about to happen in other words, they expected a responsive God. They expected and anticipated God's mercy. But we need to remember just who we're talking about. The historical context is very illuminating about how dramatic this image of Nineveh coming to its knees in ashes in repentance. So who were the Ninevites? Let me introduce you to one of the later kings of Nineveh who really kind of represents this city and its epic level of violence. I'm in a bubble again. Okay, uh, man, I've got to stop that. We're going to look at a king that was a, a, a few years later, a couple, couple kings down the line, Ashurbanipal, and uh, one of the last great kings of Nineveh before they eventually fell as well. But just how did they depict themselves? These were people that celebrated violence. And if you've uh, been with any of our looks at Jonah before in the past, you know that I always throw up a picture of them kind of choking out a lion. It was kind of a, a way for them to assert their dominance. Uh, there, there's images and, and reliefs. If, as you approach the city, there was artwork showing anybody who was visiting, um, well, how dominant Assyria was. And they were violent. These guys impaled people. They did siege works. 
they wanted everybody to know that they were they were violent. So that you see that that sin, that acknowledgement of the sin of, of violence, is on the tip of the tongue uh, of the Assyrian king. Here's uh, some subjugation pictures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Let's take a tour real quick of this important city. This is an artist trying to capture about how big Nineveh was. You could start to begin to see why it would take three days for a visit to enter into the inner of the city to actually get the king's audience. Nineveh was a very, very big and important city. The Ninevites were known for their violence and at, during the reign of Jeroboam II's Israel, which was that illusion that set the tone for this whole book, they're naming their corporate sin. They're acknowledging their corporate sin, the thing that their people group was characterized by, their, you could say, idol. They're acknowledging it. Meanwhile, back on Jeroboam II's Israel, Jonah's home territory, they have not acknowledged their idol worship and how disconnected they are from God. They have not approached God repentantly. A theology anticipating God's mercy, where the sailors and the Ninevites are demonstrating that they expect the very character of God. Who is more aware of who God is in this story, the prophet who's supposed to attend God and to carry his message, or the broken, aware people attempting to seek God in their lives, the sailors and the Ninevites. This story is a challenging mirror against the spiritual supremacy of Israel. I think it could also challenge the spiritual supremacy of the American church. An interesting dilemma. The person who's supposed to represent God and his message is advancing God's kingdom despite of his own buffoonery. Yes, I just said buffoonery. So he, he's an anti-prophet. He represents a poor carrying out of the mission of God. And in part, the mission of God is the global advancement of God's kingdom. Through this people group, the Israelites, through the Abrahamic promise, and, and through the, the covenant at Sinai, are supposed to be a kingdom of priests and to, to, to represent, to bring the blessing of God to other people. God is still accomplishing that despite Jonah being a terrible priest, a terrible representative of God, God is succeeding. God's mercy is still advancing even though Jonah doesn't embody it. Surely, this prophet, Jonah, can't be this successful of a prophet to bring the chief enemy of God's people into repentance with their God. Guys, if we were to situate ourselves and to let Jonah be the mirror it is to uh, so much of, of church history, of, of Israelite history, and we ask ourselves, oh my gosh, have we been like Jonah? Well, let me just let me just say this, guys. This is a theological book. It's one of the chief aims of Scripture, if not the chief aim of Scripture, that it's God's self-revelation. And what does this say about God? God is greater than any of the buffoons that represent Him. Yes, we're made in God's image. Yes, we're redeemed. Yes, we have meaning and worth. And even though we act like buffoons at times, God loves us and cares for us. Otherwise, He wouldn't have sent His Son to die for us. We know that. So don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying we're worthless and we suck at everything. But let me just say this. We often don't represent God well. We often are as much of buffoons as Jonah. I know I've been. And corporately speaking, the American church has been. For example, guys, there is a vibrant and amazing native church in America. Despite the terrible genocidal efforts of American Christians. What about the black church in America? Despite the American churches, and especially in the South, parading of, of slavery. What about the immigrant churches, in, especially in cities, where uh, American Christianity has attempted to say that, that we don't want the refugee or the foreigner here. And American Christians have largely done that. Let Jonah be a mirror guys to our own failures as a church that oftentimes God works to advance his amazing and merciful story of redemption of all peoples despite of us. And so let Jonah challenge and call to light these tendencies to not represent God well. And let us be encouraged because guys we've all had our failures. The American church has had many failures. 
We have had many failures. The heart has had many failures. Our youth group has had many failures. I have had many failures where I am just as much of a buffoon as Jonah. God can advance his merciful, amazing story despite of me and my buffoonery. So guys, let the pressure come off. Even if you represent God poorly, God can accomplish what he sets out to accomplish. And what he sets out to accomplish is nothing short of amazing and beautiful. Let us be like the God Jonah represents. Guys, I hope this has given you hope. If you ever feel like a buffoon, if you ever feel like the church is being a buffoon, God's kingdom is gonna advance. God will stay responsive, he will stay merciful. Let us be better partners in missions than Jonah and let us represent well this amazing, responsive, merciful God who invites all into this story of redemption. All right, Godspeed, can't wait to see you guys on Wednesday night.